Yeah. Styling no. Hey, y'all. What's up? It's your girl, Ambitious Brown. And um, tonight we have an amazing show for you guys. Uh, I know last week was crazy when we missed out, but we do have some great information for you guys um, starting out today. So I would like to go ahead and bring on our co-host, uh, Mr. Lloyd and Patrick, uh, to the Ambitious Podcast on this great Tuesday. How are you guys? Good. I'm good, man. Just blessed and uh, happy, man. You just It's been a trying week, as you stated, but we, we're here. We are. How about you, Pat? How you doing? Same here. Same here. Uh, just, you know, checking in with everybody, uh, family, friends, loved ones, making sure everybody's good. And um, well, like, like you said, we got a great show that we're about to talk about. We're going to break this winter storm down. Bring everybody some enlightenment and some good resources and all types of fun info about to pop out today, right? Exactly, exactly. So uh, let's go ahead and get the show started. Um, let me, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and uh, introduce our guests. Uh, let's bring them on now. How you doing, Reverend Nico Matthews? I'm good. Good, good. I want to go ahead and just kind of give the brief intro to you, and then I'm going to let you take it from there. So you are a uh, school administrator for the Humble ISD, and you're the community liaison director for state rep Jarvis Johnson. So once again, welcome to the show. Um, give us a little, give the audience a little bit of uh, your background. And um, before we introduce the next guest, because um, we're going to do a little bit different tonight, but uh, give, the, give the audience a quick uh, rundown of your background. Uh, where did you start and how did you get to where you're at now? Um, okay. Um, thank you for having me, first of all. Let me say that. Uh, secondly, uh, I got my start uh, as a kid, being involved in community service, uh, always serving others. Um, started out being in church, and so from there, uh, led to our community um, and being involved. And uh, I am a, a resident, born and raised in the Eckerson community. Uh, and so the opportunity presented itself for me to work for uh, Jarvis Johnson. And so I was able to uh, be a part of his team. And so for the past uh, five five years, uh, I've been working with him uh, on his staff as the community liaison director. Awesome. Awesome. Great. Awesomeness. Now, I'm curious because um, I work with the sickle cell organization. Were you a part of helping get the um, the legislation passed yes. for us? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> yeah, Sabrina Thank you was so much. Our, yeah, she's one of our lead people on that, but I did work with the sickle cell bill. Yes, ma'am. Awesome. Very appreciative of oh, all of oh. that that has Yes. That's good. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Awesome. And like I said, we have two guests tonight. Uh, we're going simultaneously. Uh, the next guest I'm going to bring on right now. Welcome, Mr. Eugene Howard. How are you doing today? Man, I'm great, man. How's everyone doing this evening? We're doing awesome. Good, today. good. So uh, I'm going to give my, I'm gonna give the quick intro for you as well, sir. Uh, you um, attended Texas Southern University. Texas Southern Go University. Tigers. Go Tigers. Go Tigers. Yes, uh, PV. <laughs> no man, hold on. Man. Now, now look, man. Let me get through my intro. You brother, like, know? Wait, you know, that's some beef. <laughs> oh yeah. Here we go. Go, hey, this is gonna be a good show already. <laughs> um, so uh, you are also an educator and civil rights leader, a father, a husband, a community activist, and the NAACP branch president. Once again, welcome to the show, uh, Mr. Eugene Howard. Can can you see them? Can you it look like it got froze? Uh, the, the screen froze a little bit. Okay. Yeah, his screen is frozen. Yeah. Let's give it a minute to yes. work. Okay, is it back now? Okay, there yeah, we go. There, go. there we go. I was just saying, uh, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us. Okay. All right, so uh, just like uh, Mr. Uh, Nico did. I don't use... All right, get, let's go ahead and give the people uh, a little bit of your background history and where did you start and how did you get to the point where you're at right now as an NAACP branch president? Well, I started uh, again, like you said, uh, at Texas Southern University. Um, I, I found it, uh, you know, going to historically black university, marching in the ocean of soul, 
um, and and just kind of uh, contributing in, in that manner. Um, when I uh, moved out to the area that I'm currently located, uh, you know, me and my my wife, we were watching uh, television, and uh, it was a missing girl uh, that had went missing, and you know, um, she was a young black uh, lady, a uh, young lady, excuse me, and uh, it took us four days uh, to hear about uh, the the resolution of that situation. Now, we're thankful to God that uh, she had only took an Uber from the middle school down to the rodeo back before uh, Uber became such a big thing. Um, but if that child was of a different pigmentation, if that child uh, had a, a different name, may, maybe a different family or a different family standing, uh, it would have been more uh, attention brought to that, which was uh, kind of alarming to me, given that I had just had my first child, uh, my baby girl, uh, and I was just thinking, hey, if that was my daughter, I would want a little bit more attention brought to that. And uh, I said, well, you know, where is the uh, NAACP? Um, you know, my wife was like, well, uh, I don't know if they have one out here. And, uh, uh, you know, four years later, uh, I've been the NAACP president of the Missouri County branch for two years, um, uh, well, two two and a half years now. Uh, we've gotten police reform passed, criminal justice reform passed in Pearland, Manville, uh, that area, this region. Um, and that's where I got my start. And I'm also uh, now, I uh, want to take my energy and my talents to Washington as I am running for Congress in Texas, Congressional District 22. Um, as we talk about today, leadership has utterly let us down. Uh, and uh, we need to talk about uh, holding those accountable, no matter if you're a Democrat, Republican, or independent. Any leader uh, should understand what just took place in Texas uh, should not and cannot and will not ever happen again. Yeah, I couldn't take the, the mute off fast enough, but you, you hit on some. Okay, up. like what I tell you, no, that's music to my ears because um, that's all I've been saying since it happened. Like, okay, we are the biggest state. How does this many people go without for so long and nobody be held accountable? So I'm really definitely happy that you did state, state that. Oh, okay, yes, you did. <laughs> right. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So. So uh, I'm going to start off with you, Mr. Howard. Uh, we have President Biden and First Lady. They're coming to Houston, I believe, this weekend on Friday, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Um, and they're coming to check things out. And, and a lot of things was brought to light that um, of how the energy here in Texas is ran um, versus how energy is, is ran throughout the rest of the nation. Um, so first off, starting with you, like what can be done? What would you tell uh, Mr. Biden when if if you had a chance to speak to him? How can we prevent this from happening again in the future? Well, um, so I don't want to give you like a, a false answer. So if you don't mind, if I can break something down for just one second. When Joe Biden comes, when President Biden comes, um, he can do what he's already done, which is sign. Uh, the federal disaster declaration to get us the aid uh, that we need. But the problem is, uh, just like with any other state, but we know this is a red Texas state, which means even when we get federal aid, it goes to the state. So, and then it's up to the state to decide where and who gets the resources, why uh, Mayor Turner in Houston and, and Mayor Abbott are in such odds is because the Houston area is not getting the resources uh, that we need. And we know that falls along party lines. Now, the, the energy crisis, it, it goes back to 1999 when the Texas state legislation or legislator, excuse me, uh, decided to deregulate the energy grid, which means Texas, our, our state, we are the only state that has its own power grid which means they can do what they want uh, without federal regulation, which means uh, winterizing your equipment, which means uh, having a certain amount of energy and storage in case of an emergency, things of that nature. But when you deregulate, it kind of it goes back to what the Trump administration wanted to do with all of our things. When you deregulate, you don't hold those uh, 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 companies and those uh, entities accountable to the to the worst case scenario. So they always will say, well, we're in Texas. We'll never have a storm where we're freezing for a week at a time. Well, hell, you know, with climate change that they don't want to admit, there are different storms that are coming. Like, you know, and I'm only 37 years old. In the last five years of my life, this weather thing has been something that I have never witnessed. 
and I've been in Texas the whole time. So it's that's been the constant. It's been me in Texas. But whether it's way, way too hot or way, way too cold or way, way too wet, it's it's something that's changed from my childhood to now. So what I would ask Mr. Biden to do is use his influence to make sure that we need to regulate our power grid and get on uh, on board with the rest of the country. So if there was ever a worst case scenario, the country can give us the aid we need. One thing I will kind of give it so everyone can understand. It's not that the federal government didn't want to help us. When I was with Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee, she explained it as in lamest terms as she could. Imagine that you have a driveway, right? And you have five cars in the driveway that you need to get inside the garage, but you have a one car garage. That was the issue that was going on with the power. The federal government or anyone, they couldn't send us power because they didn't have a place to send it to because our grid was not connected. So we need to make it almost illegal for states to, to, to decide that we're going to regulate our own systems of utilities. I'm not talking about a socialistic government. I'm just talking about regulations. So I won't ever have to be without power for four days a week. Now I, I I I agree, but my question is: with Texas, like we we're different here. We we do what we want, basically. So with we having so much stubbornness, I guess that's the best word to say it. Do you really think they're going to allow it to happen? Let, 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 let well, me chime yeah. in on that. If, if go ahead, go ahead, Brad. If you don't mind, I, I think here's where we have several issues with why we're off the national grid first is texas is always been the big state we're, we're the macho state you know we have enough money to want ourselves if we want to be our own country we can be our own country and so because of that attitude texas pulled away from uh the national grid because it wanted to deregulate um it's it's uh energy which is all about the, the uh dollar sign it's all about money here when you have federal regulations, you have federal caps, which means you can't charge so much money per kilowatt, basically, when it comes down to the consumer. And so when you are off the national grid, you need to take on your own regulations. And we wonder why in Texas we have such super high light bills. Yes, it's hot in Texas. Yes, we have 103 degree weather in the summer in July, August. But it doesn't mean we should have $700 light bills. The problem is there is no regulation. And we took ourselves off the grid so that we could grease the palms of people who don't look like us. In the state of Texas, energy is a state issue. It's state regulated, which means that our legislatures who had at this time the past 12 years has been Republican led. The state Energy uh, uh, Committee, Republican led, they have allowed for all these things to take place. Why? Because at the end of the day, it's all about money. The only way to change this is not through President Biden, not through the governor, not through the mayor, but we've got to elect elected officials to represent us and our interests in Austin. That's what it comes down to. We've got to go back to the basic fundamental right of voting. It's education and it's voting. They go hand in hand. And so the next election that we need to pay close attention to so that we can get people you know, into office that are going to be for us. When is it? November 8th, 2022. 2022. Well, one of our senators, uh, Ted Cruz, up for re-election. Uh, in November of 22, 2022. Go ahead, Eugene. I, I, I mean, well, I'm not the host, but... <laughs> right, right. Uh, uh, so, don't forget, I know everyone wants to focus on November, but you still have primaries when you talk of about... Course, of course, of course, of course. Yes, want yes, yes. to fight for you. That, right. That's March of 22. And Senator Cruz is up for re-election in 2024 uh, uh, as Senate, unless he decides to run for... Uh, uh, well, he can't run for anything. It wouldn't be anything for him to run for until presidency or Senate in 2024. 2024? Right. Yes. Quick, yeah, he, he just, just beat Beto. But Abbott's up for 2022. 
Abbott will be a midterm. He's up. He's up in the middle of midterm election. So you know we've got to turn Texas blue. We almost did this past uh, presidential yeah. election, but we've got to really turn Texas blue. Because you have to realize your railroad commission, all those people are dictating a lot of stuff with energy, and we're a big agriculture state. So we've got to get people. You know, at coach commissioner, we got to get the right people in the right places that have the interest that 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 we have and have our heart, you know, uh, at the top of their heart when it comes down to passing bills and policies that eventually will either hurt or help the consumer. Every bill that's passed, every policy that's written is either going to help you as a consumer or it's going to hurt you. Quick, uh, quick comment. Quick comment. I wanted to make. Uh, what you guys are saying is a hundred percent accurate. Every, every time on the podcast, we always uh, state that you know, um, you know, the presidential election was huge uh, this past November. It, it caused a big um, ordeal. But uh, at the end of the day, it starts at your local level, county level, state level, and then your uh, federal level. In my opinion. Um, I mentioned on my personal page on Facebook uh, the other day with the ERCOT situation, I I commended uh, El Paso and Beaumont because they're not on our grid. And so they had relatively zero issues. They had a few little issues here and there uh, with the energy. And I mean, that's just amazing. And it just goes to show you Texas, this big old state, we still had two major, you know, uh, metropolitans that didn't have uh, any issues. So that just goes to show you the issues that we need to work on as far as, uh, like you said, uh, getting the right people in there regardless of the the uh, political party. Right. And, 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 and you, you, uh, I think a lot of what you had also was at the end of the day, ERCOT was not prepared for mm-hmm. this at all. I don't care how you try mm-hmm. to paint it. Um, and at this point, I believe that the only way to rectify this is that we go back to being on the national grid because that's going to protect the consumer. It's going to protect uh, all parties because now there will be federal standards and federal mandates that these uh, energy uh, retailers and energy um, uh, advisors make sure that they are meeting. We were not okay. meeting federal regulation, which is why we had what we had. We didn't. Our, our backup system failed, and our primary system failed. Why was that? Obviously, someone isn't checking. Someone isn't doing their homework and making sure that we're prepared. The storm. Yeah. We knew we, we, we get, the storm was coming. We knew that it was going to be a a very hard freeze, one that we've mm-hmm. never seen. So why wasn't measures taken? Why wasn't, you know, we've got to stop being reactive and proactive. Mm-hmm. So we don't want to prepare for the storm when the storm is coming. You know, you prepare for war when it's no war. So that when yeah. war comes, you're prepared. So in order to be prepared for a storm, times like when there's not a storm, we should be prepared and ready. And that's the next thing that we've got to do. Even in our communities, we've got to be prepared for when storms come. We can't wait till the crisis comes and then say, I need water. I need food. You know, and, and so I saw some things in this this during this past week that I think um, we need to talk about so that we can make sure that our communities are not lacking so much when we have disasters because we were hit so hard. Not yeah. with the black community. Right. And Mr. Mr. Uh, Eugene and, and Mr. Uh, Matthews, I was surprised personally without not seeing like uh, measures being taken, such as putting these salt and sand on the roads. I didn't see any of that. Um, I was also surprised that, um, you know, how uh, it's so quick to have the military come out when they see like a BLM protest. But I felt like we could have had the military or some type of uh, National Guard come out to provide uh, ready to eat meal that, that they have in the military, uh, mm-hmm. passing out water, things like that. So was that something that was not provided because the governor didn't request that and, and because we were isolated in an isolated state? Yeah, who's responsible? That's that's your governor. And when it comes down to your Texas National Guard, it comes down to declaring a declaration of a state of emergency. 
um, on the state level, that's your governor. Uh, and that's, hmm. that's that's up to him and his office of emergency management and response. Um, so they sleep you know, over it. <laughs> you know, it's it's kind of like, you know, we're not a winter state, and it's kind of like we're not prepared for winter. But why? It's a season. Um, we didn't we did not have the trucks ready. Uh, we did not have National Guard on standby. We didn't have uh, any of our. Um, our state police. You know, Texas has so many police entities. Uh, we've got Texas Rangers. We've got state troopers. We've got sheriffs. We've got all these law enforcement, all these agencies, and yet they were not on standby. You know, I, I think even the Cajun Navy even ended up coming in to assist us. But why was that when we have all of these agencies that are under the leadership and the authority of our governor? Why were they not ready? Why did we not see them? I don't think they took it serious because it it never sticks in Houston. It never it'll get cold and by the next morning, you know. So I don't think they took it serious enough, so, honestly. So the question becomes people died. Mm-hmm. So are we talking about criminal criminal charges should be placed upon our leadership? So, because, if I can, I mean, I mean, you know, listen, people died as a result of no power. A 84 year old woman died in her home because of hypothermia. You know, right. so again, people lost their lives because of a lack of preparation by state leaders. Right. And, and so, it's so, so, supposed to be state leaders. So, Mr. Mr. Howard, so uh, you was about to say something. Chime in on why do you also feel like we failed as a state on that. And then what efforts, because I saw you on um, social media out in the community doing stuff. So on top of that question, what efforts did you have to take on in order to kind of um, take alleviate those efforts that were failed on our state? So, well, one, um, it, it, uh, the, the Rev was correct when he stated uh, that, you know, we, there is a, a, gubernat- a gubernatorial race in 2022, which is very important. Uh, the governor does make the decisions of ringing the bell of alarm, uh, whether it comes to resources, the National Guard, and so forth and so on. Um, now, uh, I, I kind of want to bring up that uh, what we can do, and, and one of the things that were very irrehensible uh, while, you know, I was powerless without power, uh, that our governor wanted to go on Sean Hannity to talk about wind windmills and something that was only 10% of the power of, uh, that makes up of our power grid. And they actually overperformed uh, during out the, the, the catastrophic event. So again, like what we had to do was uh, survive. It was uh, a lot of people that their homes was 32 degrees and below freezing within their homes and you can't warm yourself up. Uh, we had so many, we had over 200 carbon monoxide poisonings in a three day span. It, it just kept going over and over. Uh, we had a, a, a family in Sugarland, Texas down here uh, that a mother that had to watch her mo- her mom and her children burn to death because they were trying to keep themselves warm uh, in that with their flower place in their home. Uh, so what we've had to do is what we found out is after this, the ice thawed and the water start to try to come back, that people pipes are busted, people ceilings are uh, are, are uh, uh, un- unlivable, people homes are unlivable, and what we've been trying to give out water and food, and and so and the the aid hasn't come quick enough. Uh, they were so quick to want to make this a talking point uh, before they got caught with their pants, quote unquote, down. When you have Republican leadership ducking and dodging, leaving the, the, the country, leaving the state. You had state senators and state uh, congressmen going to Utah, trying to go to Can- Cancun until they got caught up. But you had us that were the most affected in these communities, leaders like Ron Reynolds, leaders like Dr. Shabazz, leaders like Representative Jarvis, Representative uh, uh, Senator Boris Miles. You know, the list goes on. Uh, Represent- uh, Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee, Congressman Al Green. Uh, you know, you know, the list just goes on and on. Leaders that locally believe that uh, when our people need help, that we want to strive to be there. 
And we need to start paying attention, like the, the gentleman said earlier, back earlier, that it's not just about the presidential election. Your school board matters. Why does your school board matter? They set your property taxes. They set that they control more of your every everyday life, your mayors, your city councilmen. Then you go to your state senators and, or your state representatives and your state senators. But don't forget about your commissioners. When we talked about why wasn't there ice, I mean, uh, sand put on the roads, that's the commissioner's job. And then we also got to remember we have to educate ourselves because these roads even though they may be in a city, TxDOT may own the road, which gives uh, the, the the entity, the city, the liability to say, hey, that's not our road, that's TxDOT's road. So we can't do anything until TxDOT, which is the Texas Department of Driving, blah, 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 blah. And they kind of control uh, the flow of traffic in those streets. So that's when leadership has to communicate and be in correlation and collaboration about the incidents and the entity that's coming because we knew a week ahead of time that this storm was coming and they did not ring the alarm as it should have been rung. Maybe in their private meeting, they they knew it was going to get this bad, uh, but we were not, and we are not regulated to, you know, sustain that kind of temperature for that amount of time on top of, you know, it was just, uh, they want to call it a once in a hundred year storm. But man, they said that about uh, the last hurricane, and this is like it's like these once in a hundred years are happening every other year. So maybe right. we start uh, rethinking these things that we're doing with this uh, reducing the carbon footprint on this planet. You know what I'm saying? We don't need to get rid of uh, natural all uh, all of gas and, and oils, but we can really heavily reduce carbon emissions, the things that really dilute and pollute our planet because these storms, we have to leave a world that our kids can leave for. It ain't about the Green New Deal or, or gas and oil. It's about being we, we all share one thing, no matter what your color, your race, your religion is, or your pigmentation or your sexuality is the future. And if we don't prepare for the future today, the future of tomorrow is unpromised and it will be destruction. It takes like the pastor said or the reverend said before, you got to prepare for those things that aren't happening before they start happening. So we got to start preparing right now to reduce so that way my great great grandkids can enjoy some of the same natural abilities and sights and things that I was able to enjoy. And then that's uh, what, you know, what we've been able to do throughout this week, trying to be a helping hand uh, to those in need. And I'm, and I'm calling upon the governor to really give some aid and some relief to these parents and to these families with $7,000 light bills, $17,000 light bills, and then $6,000 water bills. None of us asked to be put in this situation. You utterly failed us. The Republican GOP of Texas failed us. Texas has been ran by the Republican Party for the last 30 years. You got to eat this one. Mm-hmm. You got to own this one. Yeah, I agree. I, I guess just really quick, um, I wanted to go back to where you were saying, like, we have to vote for a commissioner. We have to vote for all of these different entities. Now, I know my biggest issue with this last presidential election or just election period is they just say, go vote, go vote, go vote. We don't know who we're voting for. Like, there's so many names on these ballots and they hold all these different positions but realistically, we're literally just voting and we have no idea who these people are in these positions. And um, just tying it back to the next generation, just how do we educate our people? How do we educate ourselves to know, OK, yes, I want to vote, but I want to know that, OK, yes, I'm voting for Sally Jackson and she's control of this party. You know, like just how do we get more information about who are these people we're voting for? I, I, I think. We have to take it to them, number one. Education and voting. So education and voting goes hand in hand. Not just education in our school system, but educating ourselves about the voting process, who to vote for, all these things. You know, we used to assume that all African Americans vote Democrat. So just go to the polls, vote Democrat. Not the case anymore. Um, and if I'm voting Democrat, if I'm in a primary and I see I've got four Democrats for this particular this, this particular position, who am I voting for? So it it also becomes the voters' responsibility to make themselves aware. We we find out information all about other people's business and what they got going on. But so if we really want to be informed about voting, we will make sure that we are informed. Social media, um, YouTube, Facebook, organizations, um, you know, information's out there. 
we've got to go and get it and take the time to read it. And the problem is we don't do that. We want everything at our fingertips. And so if I can't read in 30 seconds, then I'm not going to read it. So I believe that we have to make the information available, but also the voter must make themselves available to read the information and want to be informed about who to vote for. Why am I voting for this particular? for this particular position? What does this mean to me? How, how does this affect me in my day-to-day -day living, you know, where I live in my community? That's what we've got to do. Um, and I think we've got to, we've got to really start to be um, modern in how we get the word out about voting, about, you know, mm -hmm. who to vote for. You know, we've got to use social media. You know, it used to be the newspaper. Well, that's kind of almost obsolete now. So, you know, we've got we've to gotta come together and say, how do people get the information? And that's where we, where, where we have to be. Yes, and just kind of piggyback off of that, I, I'll be brief because uh, I, I know she said quickly. Um, again, it, it, the onus is to educate ourselves. Like, you know, uh, they say power is not given, it's taken. So if you're expecting someone to, to give you the, the magic potion to, to making this place a better place. There is none. It's about rolling your sleeves up and putting it in the work. And sometimes the work is just instead of going on Facebook, why don't you go on someone's campaign page and wow. kind of look at what they're doing. Instead of watching the football game, why don't you take that 20 minutes to read something about what's going on in your local area, whether it's your school board or what's going on. That's how you can familiarize yourself educate yourself on what's going on and guess what i'm gonna be real honest with you people out there once you i once your eyes are open to that world you'll want to be involved because you start realizing like what the hell is going on when you stop watching the real housewives of atlanta and, and then for me the cowboys are playing the xbox and you start noticing that this sign over here ain't been fixed for three months but the commissioner makes two hundred and ninety thousand dollars, and he's up for re-election but you can't even get a phone call at his office that matters and so, mm -hmm. and, 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 the, and the Republicans know the more voters turn out, the less chance they have. And Democrats know the more voters turn out, the more accountability that they have to be measured to and held to. So it's always about the people. We the people is how this thing starts in our declaration and in our constitution. So we got to understand we the people, we have the power and power isn't given, it's taken. And we don't have to be insurrectionists to do it. There is a process to where we can maintain and do what we did and elect Joe Biden and do what they did in Georgia all over this country. Texas can go blue next. Right, and then right. it, can be, it can be wherever it needs to be to where we talk about inclusivity and diversity and inclusion and not historical context and not my heritage and all that BS. Let's, what makes us the greatest together? We're the best gumbo ever created and that's what we need to do. I, I, have a quick point. I, I just want to tie two, two quick. I want to. I want to tie two quick things that you brothers uh, mentioned. Uh, first, um, as far as like with Texas, uh, you know, it, it was a big story about that mayor that said we need to be socialist. I mean, that's, I, I, I might be quoting you wrong, but he had to resign because he was like, you know, y'all want y'all want to hand out basically what he was saying, uh, right. paraphrasing, and so. What you brothers are saying is exactly correct uh, to, to, to piggyback off an of ambitious question is that, you know, we as a people have to educate ourselves on the best candidate for you, regardless of red, blue, white, black, mm -hmm. male, people, but, but we have to do our own homework to understand that, hey, you know, because they have behaviors 20 years back, Hillary Clinton, whoever, you know, I'm not trying to get political here, but, you know, they have uh, you know, behaviors of what they believed in for a long time. So it's now just coming into fruition. So that's one thing. But my second thing, too, I love that both of you brothers are out in the community. We did, we served Saturday as well. We were given hot meals and uh, bottled water. The, the, the thing is, what people are missing that I want to point out, a lot of these elderly or sick and shut in people cannot get to these distribution centers sometimes. We have mm -hmm. to be foot soldiers. I know Reverend uh, Matthews, we have to be foot soldiers and go go to these people's houses and give them water and give them because they can't necessarily. It's beautiful that everybody is. We have so many distributions. I've been trying to post everything or share, uh, you know, hey, we're at this spot. Some people don't drive. Some people don't have cars. Some people are elderly. Some people are sick and shut in. So we have to also know that people also need help 
we need foot soldiers. We need volunteers. We need people that can go to these people houses and pass out the water and pass out these snacks and pass out. So that's just I just wanted to mention that as well. Uh, so all the donations that are coming in and everything is beautiful. Keep them coming. Not to discourage right, nobody, right. but you can't just have a distribution center and say, hey, drive through because everybody yeah. is not capable. And, and, and that's one of the things that the state rep uh, always pushes is going to them. Uh, I think people like us, we were on the ground before our state was. Uh, I believe it was Thursday morning State Rep and I got our hands on about 60 cases of water, literally, and we literally uh, loaded up the truck and passed out water in Chet Park Terrace, over at Acres Home, over in Studiewood. Uh, we were out, and uh, because at the end of the day, people need water. And, you know, it shouldn't be about whether I'm a Democrat or I'm a Republican, I'm, a, I'm an Independent. At the end of the day, there are necessities of life that should be guaranteed to every American citizen. Mm-hmm. And it does not matter what aisle I'm on, if I'm red or blue, green or black, I deserve to get clean. I deserve to have clean water. I deserve to have heat. I deserve to have those basic necessities. And when you don't have that, then why wasn't our state the first people, along with our city, the first ones to respond? They did not. We beat them to the punch. Yeah. And that's why I said now going forward, we need to develop in our own communities uh, warehouses, distribution centers, where we have our own water, where we have food available during hurricane season, where we have stuff available during natural disasters that we can at least give someone something. We may not have a plethora, but we will have enough to spread until hope, until help comes. At this point, we, we didn't have anything. We didn't have anything. And so we've got to move forward and being proactive and being prepared, you know, and having those non-perishable items, having, 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 um, having clothes. You know, now we're dealing with where I've got several phone calls where people, apartments flooded and their clothes are wet in a room. They don't have mm-hmm. bedding, you know, they don't, they don't have socks and stuff like that. So we're looking at a, a, a great picture that this storm exposed the issues that were already there in our community. And so now people are really seeing it. When I've gone into homes of seniors that are 80, 85 years old that 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 are in wheelchairs and they've got busted pipes in the ceiling. They've got busted pipes beneath their home. Um, I've got um, senior living apartment complexes with no water. You know, you know, now it becomes a health issue because that's unsanitary. Mm-hmm. You know, and so again, when 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 white people, then excuse my language, when white people are hit, blacks are hit that times much more because we're already underserved, we're already underprivileged. So, if they're feeling the effects, how do you think we're feeling the effects? Because we're already behind the eight ball, we're already behind the curve, and we're already in um, in these underprivileged urban communities. Um, just like the COVID, our, our communities were hit harder with COVID. We still did it with the pandemic, and now we're hitting this with the storm. And so it's kind of like we're taking all these these big time blows, and if mm-hmm. we're not careful, our community could really be knocked out. Uh, Reverend Matthews, uh, you hit a couple great points. I wanted to also point out when you said COVID, it's like when the winter storm hit Texas, people forgot about COVID, right. and uh, a lot of people were taking refuge. Um, in, in each other's homes, uh, people were like uh, just gathering in close spaces, and then all of a sudden, it's like, okay, how do you know who you're bringing into your house? Because you're looking out for your your fellow friend or family member, but at the same time, if you're thinking about COVID, this might be a person. This might be a person that you would say, well, I don't know, uh, you can't come around me right now because of COVID. But now you got to take them in. So now you got to go deal with um, uh, COVID. Uh, you got to deal with people that are getting injured because they're slipping on the ice. Uh, hospitals are backed up. They're backed up already because of COVID. But now you got uh, people coming in because of injuries. Um, it's, it's a lot. Of, it's like a domino effect. And, and it's just a lot just here in Texas. And it seems like for a period of time, you have to fend for yourself. 
And like I said, without people like um, with like Lloyd said, he was out there um, dealing with uh, people passing out water. Uh, I saw Mr. Howard out there in the community and yourself, Mr. Matthews and ambitious out there in the community. It's like we have to take it upon ourselves and, and just a shout out to like Trader Truth and uh, Mattress Mac. Like these people out there are inspiring and where they're out there in the community. And we got to take it upon ourselves to make things right and make things better because we can't rely on anybody else. So what what's your thoughts on that? All we um, got, and we all we got, and we all we need. I agree. I mean, for me, my first thought goes to I mean, as far as uh, what Mr. Matthews was saying about we need to start just stockpiling and get uh, warehouses and fill different places up. Like, if we do have churches, do we have churches that we can reach out to um, that can provide us all of these food resources and you know just things like that? People who can go to the elderly and give them. I'm solution oriented, so like my thought process now is okay. Who do we hold accountable, and how do we fix this so that we don't have to do this anymore? And how do we just come together and just continue to help each other is craziness. We, we, we have to move from, we, we've got to move back to community. Mm-hmm. Before we had segregation, we were a community. We had black cleaners. We had black grocery stores. We had black restaurants. We had our black communities. Everything the nucleus. And so everybody made sure that everybody had what they needed. We Move to this area of desegregation, and we lost our identity as a community. Doesn't matter whether or not, you know, we have this thing where in my generation, our generation, where we go to college, we get a degree, and we move away from the hood. And we forget about all the people that's still there. And that's the very hoods that we're talking about. Those are the very communities that we're talking about. We're talking about the Acres Home. Independence Heights, the Cashmere Gardens, the Fofo, exactly, that's where I'm from, you know, the Fifth Ward, the Nickel. We're talking all about those communities that we were so eager to move away from. And guess who's moving in? People who don't look like us. So we have neglected our own communities, and we're not no longer concerned about those single citizens and making sure that they've got water. You know, and we got to get to the point where we take care of ourselves, each other. Why, why aren't we stockpiling? When I was watching some documentaries on all of these white supremacists, one of the biggest things that they were talking about in, in their preparation for Trump was that they had been preparing for this for a very long time. They've been stockpiling ammunition, stockpiling guns, stockpiling gas. Well, if they can stockpile for all the wrong reasons, why can't we stockpile for all the right reasons? Why can't we have the attitude that, listen, we go take care of our people. If the city don't do it, if the state don't do it, if the national government don't do it, we're going to do it. You know, and sometimes we've got to take that Malcolm X mentality by any means necessary. I'm not saying violence. I'm not saying any of that. But we've got to say, listen, what we got to do, let's put our money together. Let's put our brain power together and come up with master plans for our community so therefore people aren't neglected. We've got so much money in the black community. We we spend the most money, you do research, we spend the most money out of any ethnicity, but what do we have to show for it? That means we've got the cash flow, but we're not putting in the right places. Uh, you're still muted, Mr. Eugene. Uh, sorry, I didn't realize I muted the mic. I just kind of wanted to uh, jump in and say it's, you know, it's not about being separate. Uh, the Rev was uh, uh, correct when he kind of alluded to uh, that, uh, you know, when we get uh, when we get established or successful, we leave the community uh, that we grew up in. It's more important. It's not about separation, but it's about making sure the communities we grew up in have the resources uh, that we are leaving to go see. Like, for instance, my wife is an educator, and we talk about all the time that the kids that are in that uh, uh, form system of that area of the school don't even have a grocery store to go to, don't have uh, equity as far as food. 
don't have fruit. And then when they go to a store, uh, the prices in the lower income areas are different than in the high end areas. They have spent six dollars for a canister of strawberries. And then we have a mom that has four kids and thinking like this, these strawberries will be gone before we get to the house. Or well, I can use this same six dollars, get six you know, dollar burgers and, you know, some fry, you know, it turns into more than just about uh, the power grid. It's a systematic issues that must be addressed. And we got to put people in place, whether they're school teachers, principals, elected officials uh, and police officers that are about the community that want to help and, help and heal uh, and provide those amenities that the community needs that, that, that are being withdrawn. We need to be have we need to have, a uh, ecosystem of opportunity is one of my uh, platforms that I'm running with Congress on. We need to be able to b- provide uh, the, the w- livable wages. Uh, let's let's start talking about those issues that really play. You say, who do we hold accountable? We hold the damn system accountable. And how do we do that? By changing it, by getting involved and playing your role. Everyone doesn't have the same role, but everyone has a role to play. Well, I'd like to just chime in real quick. Um, I, I was in a group. I don't know if you, all, if you all are familiar with the Clubhouse app, but that app, um, there's a community of people literally all over the world, and they've already started, like, getting lists together, um, getting, like, people are buying land so that they, th- that they can farm. Because like you were saying, like, if we can start growing farms in our communities because we don't have grocery stores that have affordable food, um, there are people who are actively doing this. And I would like to share um, with everyone, I do have a list of about 75 items that everybody should stockpile and have in their homes just in case, you know, something like this happens again, Um, just to get the ball rolling, you know, just trying to provide more resources. (laughs) But I was just looking for that, so. I mean, I agree. Let me say kudos to, I think her name is Michael, and she just posted, she's a wraparound specialist. And uh, I used to be a wraparound specialist at HISD. I was part of the first group of wraparound specialists. And um, that's a great work. That's a, that's a, that's grassroots work. and that's you know you got to start somewhere, and we've got to we've got to really come together again. I'm I'm a harp on coming together because everyone does a little their little thing, but if we all come together, we can make wait we can you know we can we can send shock waves because there's so much power. I'll say this um, quickly: on Sunday, we had hundreds of meals come in um, through organization, um, the, the um, Black Chamber of Restaurants. And um, all of these black restaurants, all these restaurants came together and said, hey, listen, I can do 50 meals. I can do 25 meals. And before before I knew it, within four hours, I had gave out over 500 meals because everybody had came together. And, on, and we took all this food to people. So, again, there is unity, you know, in, in what we're doing. There's there's power in unity. There's, there's economic in unity because... Again, as a people, we're very resourceful. We find alternate we find alternate ways to survive. You know, if anybody can survive, it's it's the black community because we're used to having a little. Um, but what we, but what we have to do is we have to start coming together and being more communal. Like you said, ambitious, having that list. Here are things that we need. Identifying churches that can store it. Identifying distribution centers. Creating partnerships. We've got to be more of taking care of our brother and sister. If not, we're not going to, we're going to be a extinct generation of people. And it's up to us millennials. We've got to bridge that gap that, you know, you know, a lot of us raised old school, but we also know that the kids come behind us a little different. So we have to bridge the gap in making sure that um, we go back to being the black community that we come out of in the 60s, 70s and 80s. Um, that was about making sure that we kept our community together and that, you know, it should take someone dying like George Floyd to have a march, but we've got to start doing things to prevent things like that and, and, and being together on one accord more consistently. I, I just want to add one quick thing. I know we're running short on time. Uh, I'm with you, Ambitious. Like, I really feel um, the the important thing, I'm, I'm all about resolution. We can sit here and say, in hindsight, everybody should have turned off their water Everybody should have did this and that. Right. Well, we did, you know, and we were all impacted some kind of way, whether it was 
us, our family, our job, our kids, whatever. So I'm, my biggest thing from now to whenever we can get this resolved is to uh, provide resources for people, uh, whether it's a website, whether it's an email, how people can get in touch and how we can move forward. And like you say, already be prepared, because if you're already ready, you don't have, you know, you, you don't have to get ready. If you what's to say you don't have to get ready if you're already ready. Right. And so, you know, like you're saying, they were saying, well, it's a once in a hundred year storm. We live in Houston. We know better. Hurricane season right around the corner. You know what I mean? So we can't sit here and be like, oh, well, we're not going to have another Harvey. We're not going to have another Ike. We're not going to have another Rita. You know what I mean? We've had all these storms before, so we can't, we have to, like everybody was saying, we have to be proactive and not react because it's easy to sit here and point the finger and who did what and who was wrong. But what are we going to do when this situation happens again? Because it's going to happen again. We had a winter storm in 2011. El Paso said we're going to be off the Texas grid. Beaumont said we're going to be off the Texas grid. And, and see what happened. They were prepared for this storm. And we were like, well, you know, hey, the winter storm coming, we don't, we're not going to get another one like that. So I feel like being proactive is our best uh, weapon. And I feel like we need to communicate better. So uh, I, I, what I want to work on this week, if we can work with y'all, is like putting a list together where people have resources. We need plumbers. We need electricians. We need people that work on she because this is not going away. It, it impacted my parents, you know, um, and, and from what I understand, adjusters might not be out for another two to three weeks. That's the justice. So think about these elderly people that have to go through these kinds of things. So we need to, like, uh, be proactive and find ways that we can help our community so this doesn't have to happen again because hurricane season right around the corner. And, Lloyd, you, you hit the nail on the head. There's so many – Plumbers that are, uh, you're calling ARS or these big name companies, they're backed up for like a week or two. So what you're going to do, you're going to go without water for two, three weeks. That means you can't shower. Uh, you can't flush toilets. You can't wash your face. You have to find places to go. And it's just, it's hectic. And if you're elderly, if you're sick, if you, you uh, hurt yourself, if you're, you're dealing with COVID, what you going to do? And, 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 and that's the thing that I was saying about putting the black dollar back in the community. You know, listen, you know, let me go back. Let me say this. We've got to push trades in these schools. We've got to push our kids to be plumbers. Push our kids to be like, that's good money in being a plumber, being an electrician, being a carpenter. That, that's great money. That's not a, you know, everyone is going to go to college and get degrees. Doesn't mean that, that just because you're, you're a plumber, you're less of a man than I am. No, not at all. Because I don't do any plumbing work. So I'm going to call somebody. They're going to make some money off of me. So we've got to push that. And then we've got to be sure that we can get a, I want to get a coalition of plumbers and electricians that we can trust. And that we can send to these homes. And they give people a fair quote. A fair bid. And we utilize them. You know, we're putting all this money into these major corporations. They don't care about our people. They're not going to give us any breaks. You know, they're not going to do any charitable work. You know, uh, I, I was so glad to support these black restaurants because we didn't pay for those meals. They were free. So let's let's invest in the people that are investing in us. And let's keep that cycle of paying it forward going in rotation. And, you know, um, getting together and I, my phone number, my, my email address, if you need it, uh, I'm, I'm interested in, in working together and building this coalition so that we can have plumbers and, and have electricians and, and contractors and what have you ready to go because our seniors need help. They can't they don't know how to go online and register for FEMA. They don't know how to go online and register for the you know, they they they're eighty some years old. You know, my grandma's eighty years old, you know, and she don't know anything about online stuff, she got to call me. So, you know, we've gotta we gotta start looking out for that generation because they were the ones that fought for us. And they're the reason why we're, we're receiving the, some of the luxuries that we receive. And so what we got to do is we got to look back and take care of them. And so I'm all for getting together and building resources in a network. I'm all for it. Yeah, same. Because uh, I can definitely help any 
anyone who is interested in getting into those trades, um, I can plug you right in and help you get right on started. So yes, uh, my number is before I leave off. Uh, I've got another Zoom call. My number is eight three two for audience five eight eight three two nine six zero three four nine nine. My email address is Nico Matthews. It's N I C O M A T H E W S twenty eight at gmail dot com. Call me, email me, text me, um, any type of resources or anything. If you whatever you need, just just call me. If I don't answer, I'll call back and uh, I'll make sure that I do contact you know contact oh. you back. But I really do want to want us to take from tonight and really build on it so that we can be in place and just do what we need to do to help our people. Thank you, Reverend, Reverend Matthews. And before you go, um, and then I'm going to get to Mr. Howard. Uh, before you go, uh, tell the audience and everybody, um, in, in the next five to 10 years, uh, where do you see yourself? And then um, as you tell us that, leave your contact information one more time so that we can um, share that with our audience. Um, for sure, um, you know, I love serving people. Um, that's 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 my 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 purpose in life to serve others. Um, how I'll be doing that, uh, you know, hopefully through uh, through the church as well as through uh, serving the community, uh, perhaps in a position of power as elected official. Um, so uh, we'll see what the Lord says about that. I, I did run for school board in Aldine uh, two years ago, uh, lost uh, by a slim margin, uh, but. You know, who knows what the Lord says, but I do want to continue to serve uh, and I do want to be serving the next five to 10 years until um, until my time down here is up. Uh, and so um, I'll, end, I'll end on that and uh, I'll give you information again. It's uh, Nico Matthews, 28 at gmail dot com. Uh, my phone number is 832-960-3499. Uh, let me thank you all again. Um, Lloyd and Patrick and Ambitious and uh, thank you um, for sharing the platform. Thank you to Eugene. Pleasure to meet you. Go PV. <laughs> and uh, if, I, if I could be of any assistance to anyone, y'all know y'all can just give me a call. God bless y'all. Hey, God, God bless you too and thank you for everything and thank you for everything you've done. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. All right. And uh, Miss, Mr. Howard, are you there? For, you there? Can you hear me? Let me, let me take. I haven't gone anywhere. I was enjoying the show just like you guys. You know, I, I felt like I was one of the hosts too. Just let, hey. let him go. Let him go. But yes, I'm right here. <laughs> hey, Mr. Howard. Okay. First of all, just being the NAACP uh, branch president is uh, something that is impressive to me. Um, but but also being so young, moving up the ranks. Uh, did you know this was your purpose, you know, at a young age is the first question. And then the, then the second question is the same that I asked of Reverend Matthews. Where do you see yourself in five to 10 years? And also uh, you, you mentioned about running for Congress. So is that part of your vision of the next steps with your journey? Let me answer the last question first. Yes. Uh, I, my name will be on the ballot in, in March of 2022 uh, in the, uh, Democratic primary for Congressional District 22, House Congressional District 22. Uh, so that's the answer to the first question. Yes. Uh, so obviously, I guess I'll go backwards. So then the second question, where do I see myself uh, over the next five to 10 years is in Washington, whether it be a congressman or a senator or who knows what God has in store uh, for me in my life. Uh, like the Bible says, uh, he knows the plans that he has bestowed b before me and has for us and it's uh, plans for me to prosper and not for me to be harmed. Uh, so I put my faith and my trust in my savior. And uh, that's uh, so I, not just my next five to 10 years, my every day, my every breath, uh, I trust him. And uh, I don't want to offend anyone with my religious belief. Just know that my religious belief doesn't require you to love me. It just requires me to love you back. And that's the love that I want to spread through the community, the energy that I strive and that I work really hard with to be a people's champ, to be a, a fighter for the voiceless, uh, to stand up tirelessly. The sacrifices I want to mention, my wife that 
you know the sacrifices that that I have to make for, uh, to my family that that she stands behind me and my children and my family and just uh, uh, in the first question um, uh, what uh, you know I didn't I wouldn't say um, that I knew that I was going to be an NAACP president or a politician or a political uh, person uh, no I didn't uh, my goal was to just be a educator uh, and coach and and just try to coach my way to the NFL or, you know, just have ambitions to teach the next generation. And uh, uh, one thing, I am a man of faith, and, and the Bible does say when the enemy comes in like a flood, he'll raise a standard. Well, uh, it's a, it's been a bunch of flooding, and me living in Houston, Texas, uh, I can relate physically and uh, metaphorically to flooding. And uh, I wanted to stand up because uh, too long, um, have our people be been marginalized? We're dying more uh, profusely than any other race or a creed down here, and that's because of the uh, systematic issues that have been plaguing uh, this country. Uh, you know, the Reverend said before we're survivors only because we've been surviving for 400 years. You know, that is a certain ineptitude that our community, uh, a certain resiliency that we have that. Um, and it's the resiliency that I have that I want to share with not just the black community, but all communities. And I want to fight for everyone's interest, not just black, not just white, not just Hispanic, not just Native American, not just Indian, whatever the case may be. I want to fight for everyone's rights in the community, in our village, and be a beacon of light. Uh, I want, like Dr. King said, America to be true to what she said on paper. And I want to use every breath in my body. Uh, to try to bring that fruition forward. We don't have a perfect union, but we're supposed to strive to be a more perfect union. Nice. I, I have one quick question because I know we're running against the time. And, and, and hey, man, I was ready to go change my ballot right now for you, Mr. Howard. <laughs> but oh, well, thank but you. Thank my, you. my last question is, Okay, if I'm on the board, right, I mean, I'm, I'm on the fence right now. Um, in 2022 in March, whether I vote for this candidate or yours, because not to get too political, in about 30 seconds or less or whatever, because we run against the time, why should we vote for Mr. Howard? Because Mr. Howard is a fighter. I am not the perfect person. I'm not the perfect candidate, but I'm the perfect fighter. I will fight for you and your family's interest. I will fight for our community. I've been fighting. I'm not just looking uh, to make a flash in a pen. Uh, my work speaks for itself. Uh, I am a community. I am a people's champion. I will take that energy and fight for jobs and justice. We need to be able to bring economic value to our communities. We need to be able to be an ecosystem of opportunity to to lessen the wage gap, to make sure every child has the affordable health care, affordable education, to be able to uh, be a, a citizen uh, that can be a justifiable and an asset, not a liability to this American experience. And just, uh, again, I will Will never be uh, I will not tire I will not rest I will always work for you because that's what I'm asking to do I'm not asking to go fight for an ideology I'm not going to ask him to even fight for a party I'm going to go ask him to fight for you because we need someone and we all need people uh, that want to represent us and not just represent their interests well all I gotta say is, uh, well said um I um, was able to reach out to you through another person that knew you. And what's so impressive to me is that um, the way I was able to access your um, uh, access you and you were able to come to the show at such a short notice, uh, that was impressive to me because there's a lot that's going on right now. Uh, we weren't able to do the show last weekend because so much is going on. And guess what? It's still a lot going on as we speak today. But the fact that you were able to uh, be so accessible to the people, to us, um, as Michael N. Flagg says, she's voting for Eugene. Uh, you for Send me a dollar. Send me a dollar now. You know, you know, I'm running for Congress. I, you know, just saying no. Yeah, you need some dollars. I need, I need the duckies. You know, you know, send twenty two <laughs> for twenty two or something. You know, help me out. Uh, but I appreciate the support and your vote. Uh, I really, really do. All jokes aside, thank you so much. Yeah, it, it's and like I said, it, it's hard to get 
people to come in to, you know, to the show on such short notice. It was like, you know, within a day advance notice and you was able to come and um, share some, we was able to, you know, bring you on, share some light on the things that's going on. And you could tell us about what you're doing in the community. So we really appreciate you uh, coming to the show along with uh, Mr. Uh, Reverend Nico Matthews. Uh, thank y'all both very much. Uh, any, any last words that you want to leave the audience with? Uh, yes. Uh, speaking of, if you want to support uh, the campaign, I know you don't want to get political, but you said I can, you know, leave the audience. Uh, it's uh, Howard to Congress, Howard the number two Congress, uh, Facebook, uh, Instagram, Twitter. Uh, my personal uh, Instagram is Visionary Howard, as well as my Twitter. And of course, on Facebook, my name is Eugene Howard. Uh, the campaign email is howard 2 congress at gmail.com. Um, and, and I just want to just, uh, and if you want to support uh, Every Dollar Matters, uh, you can send it to Act Blue. And I'm going to give you the information. It's secure.atblue.com slash backslash donate uh, backslash howard 2 congress And again, Every Dollar helps. Um, because I will work tirelessly uh, to make this world a better place, or at least try uh, my best to do so. Well, I appreciate that, and we need like like Mac- Michael and said, um, what she, what did she say? She, I got you. Plus, you're my church member from Southwest. Is that is that mean Southwest SW? Yeah, uh, I used to be the drummer at the bridge for 15 years, man. Uh, when <laughs> wow. Chris Patrick uh, is the pastor. Yeah, I'm a musician. You know, I used to gig. You know, uh, I played with. I did the Super Bowl with Janet Jackson, oh. uh, with her and Justin Timberlake. Uh, I the was infamous there. Super Bowl. Yeah, I was, yeah, I was there on the field when the when the malfunction happened and all that <laughs> good stuff. So, uh, yeah, but that's that's me from another life. I was a musician, uh, but yes, I love the bridge. I love my bridge family. And uh, thank you for your support. Uh, a great friend, a great uh, colleague, mentor of mine, Pastor Patrick. It's 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 it's, it's amazing. Awesomeness. Well, once again, thank so you. So be blessed. Keep hope alive, and remember what makes us greatest together. That's all I got. I, I appreciate <laughs> that. I, uh, for, like I said, short notice coming in, doing a great job. This is one of the best shows we've had. Uh, so thanks once again, Brother Dean Howard, the NAACP branch president and future congressman. Speaking into his senses now. Yes, sir. Y'all be blessed now. Remember. All follow- right. I did. I followed. So I'm going to be rooting and holding you accountable because you're going to get my vote. So what's up? <laughs> I appreciate that. Hey, that's what it's about. I, hey, no love lost. I, that's what I want. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Thank you. Oh, this was great. Yeah, it was awesome. So we want to make sure we share everybody's um, social media information um, so they can be in contact, follow, support, because it isn't just supporting just to support, but it's actually making a difference in the community, uh, the world we live in, the people that we're talking about now, Ted Cruz, uh, Greg Abbott. Um, They got to go. These are people that we're talking to now that could be future governors, future senators, future congressmen. Mm -hmm. So the people we're talking to now, like we're the generation that can be in these positions that's uh, coming up where the people that are underneath us are talking about, hey, this is what Lloyd is doing. This is what Mr. Howard is doing. This is what Ambitious Brown is doing. (laughs) This is what uh, Mr. Nico is doing in our state. So when things come up, come up and arise, you know, our kids and family members can say, hey, you know, Lloyd, I'm going to vote for Lloyd because he's going to make sure we're ready for a pandemic in, okay. 20, in 2040, you know. Shoot, give me like a couple of years. I might have to run for a position because um, I love my state too much for it to, you know, we got to do better. <laughs> The, my, my takeaway from today is just really, man, just being educated, be proactive, mm-hmm. uh, do your homework. And also, if you are fortunate, pay it forward. You know, don't just think about yourself. Um, you know, I, my uh, I had a pipe burst, too. I'm in an apartment complex, but it was to my washer outside. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So it's like that's I mean, yeah, that'll get fixed eventually or whatever. You have renter's insurance. That's cool. 
but let me go see what I can do to go help somebody else, you know, that that's in more dire, dire need than I am. So, you know, we get so caught up in what we have going on that we forget that there's elderly, there's kids, there's uh, special needs, you know, people out here that, that need that help, need that assistance. They can't go to a distribution center. They can't go to Toyota Center to go get, you know, water or whatever. So you, you have to go knock on people's doors. You have to, Hey, you know, are you okay? You know, love thy neighbor. You know, that's, that's one of the basic things you learn in the Bible. Love, you know, and again, it doesn't matter if you're black, white, Democrat, Republican, female, male, you know, whatever It's love thy neighbor. And so that's one of the things I took away from tonight. And it was a great show y'all. And ambitious, you're going to get the final word real quick before you do that. Um, we have, let's, let's shout out to the audience that's been watching real quick. Uh, Lloyd, this is our boy. DJ, DJ Sasha. To real <laughs> M-E-T-H-O-D. Uh, he says, great podcast, very informative and crucial topics being discussed. Uh, so that is the whole podcast with a purpose that's what we do uh we have michael and flag who um she's a um long time follower um uh, exactly you know, she's a wraparound specialist with hisd and um she was asking a couple of questions throughout the podcast we had uh so i appreciate you michael and flag we have arvin uh d medlock jr was shouting out dr Matthews, uh, there was somebody else. Oh, Kirsten, don't, don't forget, don't forget the uh private chat. I mean, they can't see it, Pat, but uh, ah, they had some, right, they, they, had, they had some great information in there. If you want to shout it out quick, you're exactly right. So, so Kirsten, thank you for uh, she's part of the uh, lamp team. Things that make you say, hmm, because it's a lot of things we didn't know about until this mm-hmm. winter storm came about. Um, so we had, let me go to. Let me go to the comments. It was um, it's in a private chat, but it was from Jai Daggett, and that's spelled D-A-G-G-E-T-T. Um, he said, churches, philanthropic, ph- philanthropic groups, food banks, we need to secure channels to distribute to our communities or we become reliant on someone else to meet our needs. We need to create a modern day green book. So um, thank you for chiming in, Jai, J-A-I. Uh, Daggett, D-A-G-G-E-T-T. Um, so um, these are a lot of great things that's coming from people in the community. And like I said, um, Ambitious, what do you have to say as you uh, give us some final words? Well, I mean, community is important and it is time for us to come together and unite and basically just start looking out for each other. Um, we do, I, I have, I am going to figure out a way to um, share the list with everyone, but we just need to just start getting resources on our own to just so that we can be able to give, um, you know, give, give resources to others. So I just say, you know, just keep community first. Think about others as what was saying before you think of yourself and let's just come together and make sure that if this does happen again, that we can actually just continue to help each other and it not be as bad as it was because we, we were able to unite and uh, just bring upon peace and happiness and help towards everyone. Yes. Peace, happiness, and help. A uh, quick couple of items I want to say. Um, there was so many great points brought up by uh, Reverend Matthews. Uh, very appreciative of uh, Eugene Howard coming on the show. Um, NAC, NAACP president, uh, branch president. Um, it reminded me of a movie I just seen talk um, about the um, Black Panthers, Fred Hampton. Um, and then at the same time, the same weekend, I visited Chinatown and just by seeing how they were patronizing their own stores was mm-hmm. it's something I've already known. But, you know, in our community, um, like they touched on it during the podcast, it's like um, we don't patronize our own community. We don't patronize our own selves. And it's not that we need to be segregated, but it's it's a fact of being proud of our own selves. 
And I don't think that enough of us are proud of our own selves to where, you know, we feel like, hey, um, you know, I got this black owned store here that's doing great, uh, but I'm going to go to Walmart instead. You know, um, the prices in these stores in Chinatown were way higher than Walmart. They were way higher than Kroger's and H-E-B, but it was still packed and filled with their own people. Um, Mm -hmm. One thing that we also need to make sure we do is not just create a business and say, hey, you know, you need to come and support us. But we also need to create businesses that um, are high quality because, you, you you know, we shouldn't create a business that, hey, we're giving you this cheap fabric and expecting you to pay top dollar for it. Uh, We also, as you know, as a black man, as a as a business owner, entrepreneur, you want to create something that's high quality and charge, you know, the value for it. So once again, you need to patronize your own business and patronize your own community and blacks. Uh, But you also want to make sure on on your side, you're doing what you need to do to make sure what you're providing is high quality and great customer service. So it goes both sides and we need to make sure that we hold each other accountable for that. Quick, quick point. I'm going to piggyback off what you're saying, Pat. Um, And, and we can go on and on all about tonight, but there are some black businesses out there doing well. Uh, I know Bax, uh, I'm sorry, Max from Greasy Spoon. He even made it to Good Morning America. We know him. Uh, Pat, you might remember from Hooping back in the day. He uh, I remember him. He I'm started going to, a he started a, yeah, greasy spoon. He started off yeah. with a goal of one thousand dollars. He was going to give ten people a hundred dollars for groceries when the storm hit. He's reached up to seventy thousand. I want to say last time I checked, it might be up to a hundred thousand now because so many people. So shout out to Max, um, and he's going through his own health issues right now, cancer, um, and still pay it forward, right? Um, the, the chef for Lucille's, if anybody in Houston area goes to Lucille's, a very good black owned restaurant, they paid it for, it. they have some good stuff going on. So there are businesses out there. What you were saying, Pat is, is a hundred percent correct. Patronize these, um, these businesses. I think Burns barbecue gave out like over a hundred, some meal, 500 meals or something on Monday or what the yeah, yesterday. So, there are businesses. Uh, what we have to do is communicate better and put that stuff out there, put the message out there. Like and like I said, this week, what I really want to concentrate is putting something together for resources, for the plumbers, for the electricians, ele- um, electricians, uh, businesses that where people can go to. And if they spend a dollar, two dollars, whatever, that money is going back to the community and where people can uh, get receive assistance. You know what I mean? So that's all I have to say. Yeah. Shout out to uh, Third Good Deeds, our little brother, Sheldon. Um, let's see. There's another uh, comment that just came up. Oh, that was uh, I think it looked like Michael and. Michael Flag said, create a Google Doc or QR code to get our email. So that's a good, appreciate the suggestion. Um, so we're going to be working on some things off show. So um, that's it for me. Uh, great show tonight. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lindley. Thank you, Ambitious Brown. So um, the Ambitious Podcast, we are signing off. Uh, we will see y'all next Tuesday, Black History Month. Um, patronize your black owned businesses, not only this month, but just moving forward. Uh, we don't need black history month. We need black history all the time. Uh, we need to recognize that and be aware of that. Not only just during February, but, um, throughout the entire year, every year. So we will see y'all next time. The ambitious podcast. We are out. All right. Right.